Hey, good morning. So my name is Marina Walter Antonio, and uh, I'm from Mayo Clinic. <clears throat> and this is a special session to really honor and pay tribute uh, to someone that is very special to the entire astrobiology community and is particularly uh, beloved uh, by the early career astrobiologists and those that um, still like to think of themselves as such. Um, <clears throat> and of course, I'm, I'm talking about Carl Pilcher, who is uh, right there. <laughs> no, hang on, hang on, hang on. So uh, Carl, as you know, has um, retired recently from uh, uh, his position as an AI director, uh, where he was a, a kind and very caring uh, uh, mentor to, uh, and, and an inspiring uh, leader to many, many young minds um, for over a decade um, and continues to be such. Um, and, you know, I could uh, go on for hours on to, as to why that is, but I really would just highlight uh, one aspect of it, uh, and that is that he really has pioneered the concept of interdisciplinarity. And what I mean by that is not like the interdisciplinarity that Many of us think as, uh, you know, at the faculty level where you call up your colleague from another field that has some cool gadget that will look good on your grant. Uh, that's not the type of interdisciplinarity that I'm talking about. Uh, he really pioneered the interdisciplinarity at the thought level. Uh, so he basically picked us as undergraduates and graduate students, put us together, thinking about astrobiology and about solving problems uh, before we became specialists. Uh, and it took me about 10 years to really understand uh, the value and the meaning of what he had done to us, um, but now I get it, I think, and I'd like to illustrate that with an analogy, which is that if you as an adult who grew up in a homogeneous community are put into an ethnically diverse community now, or a gender identity diverse or sexual orientation diverse community, you may have all the best intentions to really understand that world, but you'll never understand it as well as somebody who simply grew up there. And to who that is normal, that's what's normal, it's that diversity. And this, right here in this room, is what's normal to us, because of you. We grew up in this environment, and uh, you know, I have decade-long friends uh, because of that. And, and I can only, you know, my only hope is that there are you know, other astrobiology leaders in other worlds um, that are like you, and uh, I hope that you know, one day, future generations uh, of humans will, will know life elsewhere as normal, the way we know interdisciplinary is normal uh, with you. So, and with that, I'd like to welcome a good friend of yours, uh, David Demaray, to the, to the stage. Um, he is a research scientist at NASA Ames, and he's gonna explain to us how to make another Carl, because we need that. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's a Hoosier, like me, so he's, he's an amazing person. Um, he did go to Purdue as a, for a bachelor's in uh, uh, chemistry, Nobody's perfect, but but then he did he did fix himself uh, with a, with a master's in uh, um, in geology and a PhD in, in geochemistry at Indiana University. Uh, so please, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, when you hear about uh, the summary of Carl's career, you'll realize it's just no chance evolutionary accident that he came upon. <laughs> this role in interdisciplinary science, his career reads like the history of recent major advances in planetary science, quite frankly. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn in 1968. Uh, if these numbers are shocking to you, they're shocking to me because we're only about a year apart. <laughs> uh, in 1973, a PhD in chemistry from MIT. As a grad student, and this is mind-boggling, he led teams that discovered water, ice, and Saturn's rings, and in three of Jupiter's Galilean satellites. Okay. <laughs> Joined the faculty at University of Hawaii, first Institute of Astronomy, and then later Department of Physics and Astronomy, whereupon he discovered and analyzed the weather on Neptune, basically dynamic processes that were observable, and he participated in the discovery of methane ice on Pluto. <laughs> In 1987, he made the transition from academia to government through a master's degree from Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton and began his uh, NASA management career in 1988. First as science director of the Office of Exploration and then with the Office of Space Science and Applications, he led the scientific, uh, science development of planet, planning efforts for making humans, or for sending humans in, uh, to the moon and Mars. This is the George H.W. Bush initiative that some of us remember. 
He led the development of, uh, of, in, of solar system exploration robotic missions, organized the science team for the Clementine lunar mission, led the development of the Discovery Program, a non-trivial program that we now have. It's done wonderful things uh, it's with small uh, co mission concepts, including the inclusion of Sojourner Rover in Mars Pathfinder mission. Okay, Subsequent positions uh, developed international partnerships for space science programs and the science direction of the solar system exploration program in general. His transition to astrobiology was inspired by the discovery of exoplanets and by the whole revelation surrounding the Allen Hills meteorite in the mid-90s. Uh, he was responsible for astrobiology-related initiatives, including, and not <laughs> a minor detail here, program scientists for the Kepler mission in those early days where you know, its, its uh, progress was an uncertain thing. Uh, NASA's participation in the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea, and of course, managing the astrobiology program per se in 19, or 2005. He became NAI director in 2006, managed over a thousand members of this, steered the NAI towards a more supportive role uh, of missions for of NASA, um, and providing, of course, as you've heard, inspiration, support for students, and international participation by you know, teams uh, trying to get astrobiology started in other countries. He retired in 2013, but he returned in 2014 to ease the transition to a new director, which now we have Penny Boston uh, with us today. He's taught, he's taught a number of college classes since 2013, and I've just learned that he's now with Blue Marble uh, Space Institute of Science, providing an interesting supporting role in cancer research. So another lateral gene transfer in progress here. So, you know, you look at all of that, and you know, for me, I get some key personal observations about Carl. First, he's an accomplished research scientist. I mean, obviously made some major discoveries early in his career, who then became a program manager. I mean, these folks are worth their weight in platinum, okay? Maybe gold, gold's got a higher market price right now. Um, knows challenges and appreciates the value of research and then goes into management. Uh, therefore, has effective management skills and knowledge of that playing field at NASA headquarters, you know, and we know how that can be. Uh, exemplifies a science manager who is incredibly valuable for research and missions. I mean, he's in there managing and uh, involved with decisions, but he has that research background, a successful research background. And of course, the evidence of his effectiveness is, of course, the record of successes of the, all these programs that I listed. There, he demonstrates an intellectual capacity and flexibility to respond to opportunities to make missions happen and to guide the emergence of new science discipline, as you've heard, really crucially involved in astrobiology in its early days, successfully navigated major, major career changes. A chemist spectroscopist taking a microbiology course at Marine Biological Laboratory well into his career, which then would facilitate his transition to becoming an effective uh, manager in the astrobiology program. Of course, what we know about the most here is that he became NAI director, uh, bringing those strong management skills, um, and because of that background, linking NAI more strongly to NASA uh, goals and objectives. Maintaining a, a remarkable institutional stability for NAI during a period when, you know, you know, it was still establishing itself in the landscape of NASA. And of course, ha it maintained this high scientific productivity. And of course, all of this is made more possible by the fact Carl's an incredibly personable, empathetic, creative, uh, person who's really strongly supportive of others. I'd like to close by uh, mentioning something that Barry Bloomberg uh, once said. Of course, he was a former director himself and, of course, Nobel laureate. And he once remarked that scientific research is like building cathedrals, which, of course, is a long-term, multi-generational effort. Those who create the foundations will not live to see the ultimate culmination of their efforts. Carl Pilcher uh, not only performed breakthrough research that supplied several of the building blocks for this planetary science cathedral, he then became a major architect who helped to build key NASA programs, including astrobiology, that will create an enduring legacy in science and exploration. So thank you, Carl. Among the early career scientists, we always joke that astrobiology has more hugs than any other conference. <laughs> 
Um, so we're going to open for community comment um, for people to share their stories about Carl in just a moment. But I, I do want to thank uh, Marina and Estelle in particular for organizing this session. They did a wonderful job um, doing this. So just a, a thank you for them. And as a part of the, the, the reason that we have such a wonderful uh, community is because of, of, of all of us together and inspired by Carl. Um, so I don't think that we're going to have a chance for everybody to come up to the mic probably in the short amount of time we have. So I just thought maybe I would invite everyone to stand that thinks their career has been positively influenced by Carl. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that can test to it. Yeah. So. So I, th I think uh, I'm obviously not everyone in this room whose career has been impacted by you is standing here today, but there are a lot of us. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm going to echo Marina's comments a little bit, but I think a lot of us um, were, were raised as astrobiologists. We grew up. This is this is home. Um, and, you know, wouldn't have a discipline without astrobiology. I'm, I can stand here proudly to say that astrobiology is my discipline because of Carl's inspiration and, and driving us from a really early career stage to, to really ask the big questions and go after them and not see the disciplinary boundaries that had traditionally been there. So thank you so much for that. Just really inspirational to our career. So please others um, come up and uh, let's share our stories about Carl. Oh, I cut you, sorry. Uh, so, how many people here have heard Carl play the piano before? Yeah, I, I think anybody who has knows that he could have easily chosen a career as a celebrated concert pianist. And I say this just to remind us all of how lucky we are that he became an astrobiologist instead, because there are a few uh, who have done as much as you've heard to support our community. Thank you, Carl. I didn't realize you have such a fierce beard when you were young. <laughs> <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> um, one aspect of Carl that's been absolutely incredible, particularly for us early careers, is his trust in placing in us the responsibility of a conference. And I can speak for many of us early careers that AbGradCon has been fundamental in how we do science. Personally, my, some of my best friends and closest colleagues emerged from that. And for me personally, it made me realize that when you work with your buddies on topics that are not necessarily only about astrobiology, you can accomplish fantastic things. And that's something that would have been impossible without the trust of, here you guys, have a little bit of money, organize your conference, no PIs, have a great time. And I think that the, the, the tightness uh, of our community, like Sarah echoed, uh, through the, the density of hugs that are at AppSycon compared to AGU, for example, is, <laughs> is a true testament to Carl's leadership. So uh, thank you for that. So it was almost exactly 10 years ago um, that, and Carl still didn't have a lot of hair 10 years ago, I want to know when the hair disappeared from those photos, um, that Carl gave me a call and said, Ariel, I, we'd like you to chair the Science Organizing Committee for AbSciCon 2008, which at that point was about a year away. My first reaction was, what? It's only a year away and you guys don't even have a science organizing chair? What? What? Um, but my second reaction was to be a bit daunted, and I, and I recall saying to Carl something like, you know, I don't know that I have the experience to do this, nor do I feel that um, uh, I necessarily have the stature to be the chair of this committee. And Carl said something that I'm sure many of you have heard something like this, I don't remember the exact words, but something to the effect of, oh, I think you'll do very well. I think you'll be fine. And it's that combination of creating opportunity and providing this sort of quiet, calm reassurance that I think 
is, is, is the hallmark of the way Carl has nurtured many of us, many of the early career folks here who are still, still call themselves early career and those of us who now have enough gray hair that uh, we're beyond early career but still remember what that was like. Um, so thank you very, very much, Carl. I wouldn't be here uh, without your calm, patient uh, opportunity creation and support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren, and uh, I'm kind of an early career astrobiologist because I came into it a little bit late in life. And so I really uh, so distinctly remember the first, I remember the first phone call I got from Carl, which he said, uh, you are now director of an NIA center. And I told my wife, and she said, that's Nick Hud playing a joke on you. <laughs> and, uh, but then I met Carl, and I was so struck by this person who has no filter. I didn't see... I never saw Carl look tired or bored. You know, everything in science is interesting to him. And he has this sort of childlike wonder um, when, he, when he is around science and being presented with science. And, and that has really inspired me, and I've, I've sort of tried to foster that in myself. So I use, I use Carl as a role model, and I always will. So thank you very much, Carl. Hi, Carl. So I've been thinking, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about what to say about you um, since we've been uh, receiving wonderful emails from Marina about this, and it's 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 very difficult for me to summarize with with my known English vocabulary what what you've done to to our community and to us, and and I think it's it's the sense of belonging that um, that particularly I think you've um, contributed in into our lives, but. On top of all that, you you came into my life at a time where I I wasn't sure if if science is right for me, and and the reason for that was I was interested in so many different fields and so many different questions, and I wasn't sure if 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 um, one field could feed that, and and you not only showed me that that there is a field, this is astrobiology, and and there is a place for all these questions, but also there is a room for heart and gut in science and that we should combine that and, and go for it. So thank you very much. And, and, and we've been talking about Steve J. Gold and the role of chance and necessity in, in evolution. And Steve has this wonderful um, sentence from his wonderful book called Wonderful Life that I know you love. And he says that we, we pass through world, but just once and, and what a great passing. And thank you very much. But so, so glad that you passed through our lives. Thank you very much. I just want to kind of, um, you know, um, emphasize a little bit more about how Carl created a sense of f family and community in astrobiology and how much it's made a difference, especially for me and I think our entire community. Um, when I when when I started my PhD, I came into uh, the I came into the astrobiology fold along um, early on in my career. But when I actually started um, with my PhD. Um, I had come from a very tumultuous master's degree, just won a NASA fellowship, and I had to do summer rotations at NASA Ames. So my first summer, my first summer arriving at NASA Ames, I was full of anxiety, a little bit of imposter syndrome, especially being a minority PhD student in this new field of astrobiology where there wasn't a lot of me around. And I remember going over to the NASA Astrobiology Institute, the main office at Ames, and just feeling super welcomed by Carl and everybody um, in the office and just seeing the sense of home and community and family that was just generated just within the office itself. I mean, it was always welcoming. Um, there was many times if Carl wasn't busy, he'd have me come and sit down and ask how I was doing. They would always offer me food. It felt like going home, like, hey, there's food. There was always food in the conference room. So I always got fed every time I went there. And so it's just this feeling of family that's that I got from astrology that just helped me stay in this community and made me want to continue to develop in this community, contribute to this community, and bring other young scientists in this community. And it truly is like coming back home to the greatest, biggest, most wonderful family reunion every time I come to one of these meetings. And I thank you, Carl, for creating that sense of family and community 
um, in, in our discipline. So I, I first met Carl when I was a PhD student, and I was the lead organizer of the AvGrad Con in 2008, and I would uh, absolutely echo what others have said about the importance of those conferences in building those interdisciplinary and, and actually international links uh, at a very early stage in the career that, that we're all still using now as, we, as we've advanced. And I, um, in, in addition to what the others have said about thanking Carl for the financial support, I think what struck me was the, uh, and was really important, was the personal interest that you showed Carl. And I remember you gave up a good portion of your Sunday to come and spend time at the conference and talk to us uh, and listen to us, uh, which was just uh, really important and really appreciated. And um, Carl's uh, support for the early career community hasn't stopped. Just uh, I now work at the UK Space Agency and I, I fund uh, scientists and um, I was chatting to Carl just yesterday and I asked him uh, about you know, what he thought had made the NAI so successful uh, apart from the money which you know, always helps and the first thing he said to me was um, investing in the early career community and um, I totally agree with that and, and thank you uh, Carl for all your support over the years, uh, a lot of us appreciate it. Just, I apologize, we're running out of time, and this speaks to how many people want to really talk to you, and I, I welcome uh, you still to come, and, but just in the interest of time, um, I would just like to um, give uh, Carl a um, poster that was uh, uh, generously made by you know, Estelle Dodson and Kirvin, Melissa Kirvin Brooks and uh, Dale Cruikshank and David Morrison, and who helped with the slides too, and all, all the images, and um, still want to let people know that if, if you haven't signed it, you can sign it. Um, uh, outside still, uh, but Carl, just if you want to say a few words, you're welcome to as well. But it's just for you to remember all of us and never forget us, <laughs> because we'll never forget you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh. Um. I learned something when I went into government administration, which I did almost 30 years ago. And that is that there's another sense of the word enabler. We tend to use the word enabler in a negative context. But there's a really a very, very positive context of the word enabler. And I realized that government administrators are enablers in that very best sense of the word, because I realized after a year or two in government, and it did take me a little while to realize it, that my job wasn't to enable the community that I was serving to do great things. And I started off um, mostly serving the planetary science community, and then astrobiology came along. And I thought, wow, this was something that I, I could not not be a part of, and, and through some of the ways that you've already heard about, I managed to learn enough biology to, uh, to become a part of this community. And there is nothing in my career that has been, uh, there's nothing in my career that has been more rewarding than enabling this community to do the things that it has done. So my success is 100% a reflection of your success. It is what you have done that has made the astrobiology program, the NASA Astrobiology Institute, my tenure as director, uh, it, it is what you have done that has made that all a success. So thank you all for everything that you have done. And uh, I, am, I am touched more than I can say by the last 30 minutes or so. Thank you.